talking about promises of God, the confidence we can have in that which He has promised us. Uh, some are for now, some are for later, some are for now, but we don't walk in them for different reasons. And the reason we've been looking at in this case is using Joshua and Caleb and the Israelites of the Jordan River with the promised land on the other side, a land of rest, of bounty, but their fear, other than Joshua and Caleb, their fear that did not take them in faith across to occupy that land. And so they missed it. And we've been talking about that. I'm not going to rehash it. Um, but we're going to continue with it. Uh, as George and Banner have pointed out in his book, Joy, you know, Rahab's words 40 years later, 40 years later, confirmed that Joshua and Caleb were right. The people were like, we've been waiting all this time. We've seen the goodness, the power of God in your life. What took you so long, basically? to come into the land and take it. We knew it was yours. We've just been trembling in fear waiting. And we've seen that. I mean, I mentioned last week that I sometimes wonder if the forces of darkness don't say the same thing about the church. You know, we know we've been defeated. We know who Jesus is. When are you guys going to wake up to that and start taking the battle to darkness? You know, when are you going to start being an offensive force, not a defensive force? When are you going to start walking in the name and the authority and the anointing of God and doing what Jesus did? Going around, taking on the forces of darkness, taking on sickness, taking on demonic activity. You know, seeing those who are not of their right mind be made right, seeing people set free. You know, Jesus already did the hard work. When are we going to walk in it? And it wouldn't surprise me if someday we see that the thing that's so sad to me about this is it was the non-believers who were more believers than the believers. And I know that's a mouthful. But it's the ones who weren't the Israelites who had more faith in the God of Israel than the Israelites. You know, they're the ones. We've seen what God did. We've seen how he parted the river. We've seen how he did all of that, you know, the sea. And the Israelites are like, oh, we're too scared. You know, even though God said, I'll give you the land, I'm going to go with you into the land, I will deliver the land to you. And so we've been looking at, we don't want to be those people, right? We want to be the ones that stand in faith and joy and peace. We want to be people that face obstacles in our life with a faith-filled response. So we've been looking at Caleb. Numbers 12, 14, 24, God said of Caleb, My servant Caleb has a different spirit. He has followed me fully. I'm going to bring him and Joshua into the land. Um, and so we were saying, what is that spirit? What is that that's different about Caleb and Joshua? You know, all 12 spies saw the same thing. What did these two also see or put their faith in or choose to trust? In the face of the same seeing this amazing land that was available to them and promised by God, and seeing what they would have to do to overcome that, but having God's promises. And we saw that Caleb was a man who encouraged others to walk in faith. So there's, there's your first one. We looked at this last week. It's, we've got this. We can do this. God is with us. He's a voice of encouragement, a voice of faith in the face of fear. That's what we need to be as Christians. You know, we have all these promises from God. Resist the devil, he will flee. All these other things. And we need to be those who tell our brothers and sisters when the news looks doomy and gloomy and all this and that. You know, this is, we've got this. God is with us. There's a bigger picture. Let's not forget that. Caleb focused on, was aware of the Lord's delight in them. If the Lord delights in us, and we have so many promises and so much evidence of God's love for us, which is His delight within us, over us. Uh, we have that. And we have uh, that He focused on God would be the one to bring them in. See, that's our problem. We, we see the world defined by our individual limitations. And so we tend to analyze situations we face based on how am I able to overcome this? How strong, what do I have to bring to bear? But Caleb said, God will give us this land. God will bring us in. 
You know, the same heart David had towards Goliath. God will deliver you into my hand. And that's our confidence. It's never supposed to be in ourself. That was the whole point of the law, to strip our confidence in ourself. And unfortunately, so many times, we've got to hit rock bottom. We've got to see, I can't do it. I don't have it. I, I'm not, everything I thought I could rely on has been stripped from under me. The foundation has crumbled. The veneer has been peeled back and the brokenness. But then God just steps forth and says, but, but God, but here I am. Are you finally ready to walk into the place you were supposed to be in all along, the place I created you for, a relationship with me, my life in you, you and me? Are you ready for this? Because that's where I've taken you to. You and me. It's not just you. It's you and me. It is God who works in us both to will and to do His good pleasure. It is God who says who is greater in us than He who is in the world. That is His promise over and over. Resist the devil and he will flee. Why? Because I'm so bad dude? No. Because Christ in me the one who already defeated him. And, and so Caleb had this sense. Um, he, Caleb saw failure to obey, failure to trust God as rebellion. He took the relationship with God seriously. We can take unbelief and lack of faith so casually as a Christian. It's not casual to God. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please him. And this isn't because, well, fine, you don't have faith in <clears throat> lightning bolts. This is just understanding what faith is. Faith is God's love who came down on a cross and hung there and poured his love into us as a free gift, his grace. And faith is our response to that love. Faith is me saying, okay, I step to you. You've stepped to me. I step into you. Here I am. I trust you. Here's my life. You live in me. I live in you do this together. Faith is our response. And, and how could it be pleasing to God when he so treasured and desired that relationship with you and I that he sent his own son to be brutally murdered and to absorb all the sin of the world, past, present, and future upon himself and have us just go, nah. I don't trust your love. I don't trust your promises. I don't trust your word. I'll do this on my own. I got this. You know, I can make my decisions. I know what's wise. Yeah, I know you promised you'd give us the land, but I really don't believe you. Or I'm not prepared to pay the price. It, how could that be pleasing to a father that loves us so much that before the foundation of the earth, he knew all the mistakes we would do, all the, how every blow of a whip and piercing of a thorn, our choices would thrust upon his son and he said, you're worth it to me. I'm still going to make you, knowing that's where I'm going to head because of you. But I love you that much. How could it be pleasing to God for us to not respond to that? Our creator, he made us for relationship with him. When you think about how hard it is as a parent to tell your kid, don't do that, you're going to get hurt, and they do it anyway. <clears throat> Imagine how much harder it is for God. Or to, to beg them to trust you and have yeah. them say no. Um, and and the, and the difference in the real world, we have a lot of parents that maybe, you know, in some cases we shouldn't be trusting or, you know, whatever. There's so much brokenness. But we have God. And he has shown us his love in his son on the cross that we might respond. It's a free gift of grace that we might just respond. And that's faith. And so we've looked at that, and then the fifth mark of Caleb's spirit that we did not yet look at is um, Numbers 14.9. We've already had this last week, but there's a second part of it. Do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And again, this is similar to his other parts, but we're looking at what made Caleb so different. What did he see or trust that the other ten didn't? And it's this realization that the protection of the enemy has been removed. The strong man's been bound. 
Jesus took his authority over us and hung it on a cross. He took it on himself. He says, as a Christian, we have been delivered from the authority, the dominion, the rule of darkness, and put into the kingdom of Christ. Christ is now the authority over us. The authority that Satan had over you and I in our unsaved condition because of our sin is taken care of. When the sin is paid for, Satan's hold on us is broken. He has no more hold. We are redeemed. We are paid for. The debt's been paid off. You know, you put that thing on layaway at Walmart, it's not yours until you go in and pay it off. But once it paid, you paid it off, it's now yours. Assuming that Walmart didn't lose it. But it's, that doesn't happen with God. He paid us in full. It is finished. We are now His, not Satan's. And Caleb recognized that special nature. He stood on the banks. He said, yeah, those cities are fortified. Yeah, there's giants in the land. But we're God's people. And that's the same thing David, when he stood before Goliath, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would dare to mock the armies of the living God? We are God's people. And Caleb had that spirit. He said, it's not Pollyannish. It's not pretending there's no fortified cities and there's no spot giants. No, it, it's seeing them against the backdrop of God. It, it's all perspective. Perspective is everything. It, it's the, the beauty of perspective is that it still sees what's there, it just sees it differently. Sometimes people deal with situations by denial. That's not perspective. That's denial. Perspective says, yes, I see that, but I see the full picture. I see what encompasses everything, the physical and the spiritual. The reality of my God laid against this. And that's what Caleb saw. He said, yeah, that's real. Caleb and Joshua. But guys, God, the one who delivered us from Egypt, the one who parted an ocean and swallowed the Egyptian army, the God who provides miraculous food and water in the wilderness, the God who goes with us, you know, in a pillar of fire and a cloud, God is with us. And he said, I'm giving you the land. And he said, I'm going into the land with you. Guys, come on, pick up your, your hanging heads. Move forward, let's do this. And that's the spirit of Caleb that beckons you and I. God says, I didn't just save you for heaven one day. I'm not just there to be put on a box on a wall that says break glass in case of emergency. I died that you and I could have an intimate relationship every moment of your life. That you and I could walk this road together. This is who I am. And I'm within you. And I love you. And this is what he's given. He's told us as Christians, my peace I make available to you. My joy I make available to you. My freedom from anxiety I make available to you. My comfort, my wisdom, I make available to you. Mine, I make available to you. All that I am and all that I have, I make available to you. I'm coming to live in you. And, and that's the offer we have. But how many of us walk in that? You know, how many of us walk in joy? Peace, a, a, a spirit of, of tremendous thankfulness, um, hope, you know, security, a sense our life has meaning, purpose, direction, a, a, a sense of that peace of knowing we're walking in the path we were created for and in the relationship we were created for. I would venture to say we all fall short in different areas. And I would venture to say it's probably an issue of not trusting God in those areas, mainly. Because where we don't trust, we don't surrender. Where we don't surrender, He doesn't fill. He's a, he's a gentle God in that sense. I mean, He's a consuming fire and a start. I mean, I get all that. But I'm saying when it comes to us, He's actually very gentle. 
people say, I'm not going to force myself upon you. It's your choice. Are you going to give me that area of your life? Are you going to let me fully invade that? Are you going to let me trust? And, and I know many of you are facing some really scary situations, some uncertainty, some pain, um, fear, hurts, um, God not moving on the timeline you wish he would move on, you know, whatever it would be. And God says, really, you trust me. Is the cross enough? You know, do you demand something more than that? To know how much I love you? Will you trust me? The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. Will you trust me when you don't understand? Or do you demand to see and to understand before you'll trust me? And we'll never have peace and joy if we walk by sight, because we won't have peace and joy until we see what he's done on the other side instead of trusting him through the journey, that there will be another side. And that's something that we want to be really careful about. And Caleb had this spirit. I'm not saying he was perfect, Joshua wasn't perfect, but for this case study that we're looking at, it was the spirit that chose to see God's delight and love for them, that chose to see that it would be God's strength they would rely on, that it was God's promises they counted on. And this is what they walked in. And I believe what you and I have been given an option to embrace. Uh, Philippians 4, 4 to 7, uh, Paul writes to this. Remember, Paul's guys, you guys can give this lecture, you guys in men's group, but Paul's writing from prison. He doesn't know if he's going to live or not. He's got every reason to be doom and gloom. People are taking advantage of them being in prison, go out there and do things they shouldn't do. So it's not fair, it's undeserved, it's scary, it's you name it, Paul's in it. But yet he writes these four chapters of this amazing book filled with joy and rejoicing and hope and peace. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. If this wasn't a choice, he wouldn't give it the way he's wording it. It would be, I know you have no choice but to rejoice, but we do. Always. Not when circumstances align with what we hope they align with, but choose to rejoice. Let your reasonableness, your moderation be known to everyone. Why? The Lord is at hand. God is with you. That is the, the whole core of salvation is God with us and us with God. It is us restored to God. It's not heaven someday. It is now. We are saved now. Why? Because our life and God's are restored to our faith and what he did on the cross for us. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer, it's so easy to write and read, isn't it? It's so hard to do. But by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding means it's not a peace anchored in sight. It is not a peace anchored in seeing God doing what you're hoping God will do. It is a peace that comes before you see that because you have chosen to trust God. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Guard them. That's a beautiful thing to think about peace that guards our heart and our mind. That heart and mind guarded by this peace, the supernatural peace of God, is a heart and mind that is not easily ruffled, shaken, disturbed. But it's a choice. It's a choice that we are beckoned to make. You know, I've shared with you before that time I just met with Gus Best, and I was like, Gus, I don't have joy. He's like, well, do you rejoice every morning? No, he's like, well, then you're in sin. Why not? God tells you to. I'm like, that was brutal. I wanted to be coddled and, you know, <laughs> everything. And, oh, Eric, it's okay. He's like, dude, get with it. <laughs> Start making a choice to rejoice. Praise God. Praise Him until you feel happy. Praise Him until you find peace. you got to go in the woods and holler for an hour, then do it. It's what He tells you to do. It's an animal morning. It's a beautiful morning. <laughs> and exactly. And you know, and it's just Paul saying you have a choice. Caleb had a choice. Twelve spies all saw the same thing. I'm saying this over and over and over because we have to recognize it. It's not that Joshua and Caleb had some special circumstances. It's they chose to see and trust something 
more than the others who chose to see and depend upon only that which they could see or perceive in themselves. It is the Christian life. It is something we must choose, often moment by moment. Where will I place my trust? And I don't say this lightly. It is not easy. I mean, just some of the prayer requests we just got this morning, some of the things some of you are dealing with, it is not easy. I understand that. This week alone, I have sat with two different people that lost loved ones this week. And I had to talk with them, hold them, comfort them, and remind them. And watch them wrestle with, what am I going to choose to trust? You know, it's something we've got to be careful how we minister this truth to people that are hurting. And not just throw Philippians 4 6, you know, at them like a band-aid and say, I did my Christian duty. We've got to hold them and cry with them and walk down the road with them and maybe bring them back to these remembrances over and over because the flesh and the world and the reality of what we see is so strong and powerful on us. But it doesn't make this not true, even if it's hard sometimes. We see this attitude of what to focus on throughout the New Testament. Um, John, Jude, Peter, James, you know, all of them ministering to and themselves going through people, hard circumstances, hard situations, yet just blazing fast. 1 John 3, 1, here's the Apostle John. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Jude 1, 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. You are a, this is to Christians. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. James 1.17 Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. I mean, just, just a brief sample, but four different men of, of God, four different men living in the early church era, persecution, uncertainty, pain, what are they choosing to focus on? The goodness of God, the love of God, the security of God, the adoption by God. God is the source of all that is good. We're not going to find it apart from Him or outside of Him. All this is stuff that they choose just as you read your New Testament, as you read these promises, as you read these reminders of God and these examples of these men. You've been called out by God. You are as people for His own possession. You have his excellencies, he dwells within you, he loves you, he's adopted you, he is able to keep you from stumbling and present you with joy, blameless before the Father. He is the source of all that is good, and he is in you and he is with you. This is just what they are reminding of people that were persecuted, scattered, hurt, afraid. And they just, they had that spirit of Joshua and Caleb pointing the people back to that which is bigger. Could, could you see any of this? No. None of this is visible. What's visible? The doctor's report. The pile of bills. The, the phone that doesn't <coughs> ring with that person that's hurt you so much. The prodigal that doesn't ever call home. The, that's what's physical and real. We've got to be reminded of that which is still real and bigger but not as pressing in. So it takes faith to embrace it, to wrap ourselves around it. The Israelites had this opportunity like we have, but Hebrews 4, 1 and 2 tells us that they didn't have the faith. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it, for good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. 
that land was theirs for the taking. But they didn't have faith. They believed God was real. Yeah, I mean, they believed He was real. But they didn't have faith. They didn't step into a life that exhibited that belief in His realness, His goodness, His faithfulness, His power, His love. They didn't trust. They didn't surrender their life into that. So they had no faith. And they missed out. And the, the thing is that faith never stops being the vehicle by which we respond to God. It, it never stops. Joshua and Caleb, 40 years later, they lead the people, the next generation, into that land. And you would think they would experience the fullness of that promise, but did they know? Why? Because they didn't complete the job. God tells them, when you go into that land, drive out all the occupants. Drive out all the old. And Israel didn't do it. They didn't finish the job. They coexisted with the inhabitants of the land. They intermarried with them. They started to have idolatry with their gods and mixed. They tried to have the best of both worlds. Well, let's get the land, but let's not really do the work to just rid ourselves of the old. And they stopped short, and so they lived in this compromised position in which they never fully experienced what was available to them in that land. Because they didn't finish the job. They didn't continue in faith and obedience to God. They stopped short of it. And I think so often that's what we see as a Christian. Well, I got saved, so now I can kind of live knowing I'm going to heaven but get the best of this world and the best of that world to come and live in both. And we find, where's the joy? Where's the peace? Where's the meaning? Where it's so elusive? I don't get it. I, I thought I was saved. You weren't saved for heaven someday. You were saved for God now. For a relationship with Him now. In that relationship is where all that comes. Because it's His joy. It's His peace. It's His freedom from anxiety. It's His relationship with the Father that brings us into that adoption. And, and it's something that we've got to be so careful and I think that we, we, we present the gospel so wrong so often because we make heaven like the, the prize. It's heaven because he's there. He's the prize. And I think that's why so many people do the walk, you know, they go to the altar and do the altar thing, maybe even get baptized, and then never move past that. Never surrender, never pursue his words as the treasures of, of what wisdom that they are. Never let him fully occupy, never let him. And, and so we kind of live in this half and half place. Like we're still so much of the world, we're barely recognizable as a Christian. and We just kind of hold to the one day thing in heaven. And, and we don't get, we're like those Israelites. When we cross the river, right, good for you. Okay, you took that step of faith. Finish it. Go all in. God went all in for you. He held nothing back. He spared not even His Son for you, for me. So He beckons us. Hold nothing back. Trust me. Live that surrendered life. And then the last, the last point that I want to make from Joshua and Caleb in this situation, and I've alluded to it in some past Sundays, and I'm going to just go through it very quickly, maybe touch back on it next week. But Joshua and Caleb did nothing wrong that first time at the river. Their failure to live in a promise of God that was promised for now, that failure came from the choice of others around them to not trust God. We are an interconnected body, the body of Christ. I'm going to go very quickly if I can. Romans 12, 4 through 8. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. 
if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, and in verse 8, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the full scope of the body, and I, I, you know what, I'm not going to rush it. We'll just pick this up next week. This is too important. But we, as Christians, become one body with Christ as the head. And the body is interconnected. We all depend on one another. I would like, Mona, if you could skip ahead to 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Please. Probably four or five down. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit, not for you, but for the common good. God has poured His Spirit into you and given you gifts and given you talents for the common good of the body of Christ. And the thing is, you can think, I don't need church, I don't, and by church, I don't mean this building at 9.30 on a Sunday morning, though this, I believe, is very important. I mean the body. You know, you can think, I'm John Wayne, I'm Rambo, I got this on my own, I can live a hermit-like existence. But you, you, you can, but you can't. And the thing we have to realize is that's a very selfish attitude. Because the body relies on one another. You may even think you don't need anything, but what about those who need you? Joshua and Caleb needed their brothers and sisters to come alongside them in faith. And they missed 40 years of a promise because their brothers and sisters didn't stand in faith with them. We need each other. That delay in your life right now may be because some brothers and sisters are not doing what God has called them to do. Pray, engage in spiritual warfare, contribute their gifts, be a functioning part of the body. I mean, just get as practical as it gets. If you've ever broken an arm or had a body part that doesn't function or anything, you know the entire body becomes affected and limited and has to work to overcome the shortfall of that body part or whatever. That is no different in the body of Christ. We are all one body, each different in many members of it. And that is something for us to remember. It goes both ways. I need all of you, and you need all of me. And it goes that way with each of us. There may be things this fellowship cannot even move forward in until someone in this fellowship or who doesn't come, who's supposed to come, chooses to be and do what God has called them to do and be. And God will wait. Because God wants His body to be His body without resistance to that. And it's something for us to really ponder and think about. We need each other the way he's created us. And uh, it's something I think the lesson of Joshua and Caleb really speaks strongly into that. And so we'll, we'll come back to that. It's, like I said, it's too important. And then, um, so my goal is looking ahead, and I think it's doable, would be next Sunday to finish that idea of the body of Christ, obviously in brevity, and then to look at the final piece of this puzzle, which is so important is that later the Israelites are going to go, uh-oh, we're going to go do what God told us to do, take the land, and Moses says, no, it's too late. God is not with you. And they say, we're going to do it anyway. And they get whooped. And the point of that is so huge. It's why I am not moving us to a new verse of the month for February, why we're going to camp on January's. It is because it's not about religious works, it is about relationship. And what would have been good had they said yes was now bad because God said, no, I will no longer be with you. And so they could go and do what seemed like God wanted them to do and was good, but God said, no, I'm not with you anymore in this. What is important is relationship with God. It is what we do with Him. It is what gives anything life and goodness. Good is only good because it comes forth from God who alone is good. It is His life in us that makes something good. 
Apart from God, we can go to charity our entire life and finally we'll spend eternity separated from Him. That's the point of the law. We cannot be good enough because not because He's a cruel God who sets us up to fail. It's because He is what is good. It is good because it's Him doing it in us and through us. That's what makes something good. There's no separate standard of good that exists which something can just match and be good in and of itself. It is good because it is of God. That's what makes it good. And that's the lessons that Israelites had to learn the hard way at the end of this story. Well, Father, I thank you this, for this morning, and I thank you for your words, Father, and your truths. And sometimes I know they're hard, Lord, and I, I'm sorry that sometimes it seems so hard for us to trust you when you have shown us your love in a way greater than any love could ever be shown. And I'm sorry for that, Father. I stand at the top of that line, in the front of the line. I'm sorry. I ask you to speak into our hearts this week. Lord, show us areas where you, we don't trust you. And not with condemnation, as I know you have said there's no condemnation, but rather with encouragement to examine why we don't trust you, to examine those areas and surrender a little more fully. I ask, Father, for you to bless this food we're about to eat, our fellowship. I thank you for it. I thank you for this building. I thank you for the rain. I thank you for your mighty goodness on our behalf. I love you, Father, and I thank you, and I ask this in Jesus' name.